The First World War is infamous for its slaughter on the battlefields of Gallipoli, France and Belgium. We've all heard the terrible stories of soldiers caught in the awful meat grinder of the war. Despite the horrors, Australian and New Zealand soldiers forged a legend built on their resourcefulness and bravery and their undying mateship, which helped bring the survivors through the conflict. While the Anzac legend focuses its attention on the heroic ordinary soldier and sometimes the outstanding leadership of particular officers, one group of Anzacs is rarely included in the Anzac story, the chaplains. Daniel, a chaplain in a war zone, involved in the heat of battle, seems incongruous. Did the Anzac chaplains here at Gallipoli experience that? Oh, yes. Uh, most of the chaplains came from uh, rural parishes or suburban churches. And most of their congregation were women. And all of a sudden, they're plucked out of that. They're put in an all-male congregation, many of whom had never been to church. And uh, they're men trained to kill. Uh, T.P. Bennett, one chaplain wrote that it seemed strange to be a man of God and a servant of the Prince of Peace uh, and in the army. But on the other hand, uh, some of the chaplains were very militant. Uh, they saw this as muscular Christianity at its best and they were there for God, King and country. And so they had no problem with that. But for many of the officers and men, they also struggled with this idea of a chaplain who they saw as somebody uh, weak and namby-pamby um, being in the army. So how did the soldiers relate to these Anzac chaplains here at Gallipoli? Oh, well, to be honest, chaplains were not popular to begin with. Most of the chaplains were given a very hard time by these soldiers. But it wasn't long before a good number of these chaplains won the respect of these soldiers simply because of how they related to them. So what turned this perception around? Was it the personality of the chaplains or was it the role that they played here at Gallipoli? Generally speaking, it was both their personality and the way in which they conducted themselves in their role. Certainly the, the outgoing personalities, the outgoing chaplains did well. But then it was the chaplains who got involved in the ordinary everyday life of the soldiers who particularly won the respect, the admiration, and even the love, the adoration of the men. My first feelings were that I would shut myself up in my cabin. Even there, I would not find any refuge. From outside my cabin floated the most fearful language I had ever heard. I think some of them must have been trying to shock the Padre. This was my first close contact with the digger. So what was the role of the chaplains here at Gallipoli? Well, theoretically, their role was way behind the front lines. He would see the soldiers when they came out of the line, uh, run church services for them, run wholesome entertainments. In a time of battle, he would be at the field hospital, out of danger, but working with the doctors on the wounded. So a, a chaplain's role theoretically was quite removed from the heat of battle. So that's what should happen theoretically with a chaplain, but what happened in reality here at Gallipoli regarding the chaplains? Well, here at Gallipoli, there was no rear line. Everywhere was the front. Shell fire everywhere, sniper fire in many places. And so chaplains ran the same sort of risks as everybody else. That's a story that not many of us know, that these Anzac chaplains, these men of religion, actually accompanied the soldiers to the front lines and participated and operated right here in the front lines behind us at Gallipoli. Yes, and that's part of the reason why the chaplains here won respect, because they ran the same risks as, as the common soldier. They lived the same life, they were on the same diet. Now, 
Ordinarily, a chaplain was an officer, and officers weren't particularly liked. He was also a non-combatant, and that was another reason why soldiers perhaps wouldn't have respect for a chaplain. But here, the chaplains were involved in every aspect of the soldiers' lives. They took risks that many soldiers wouldn't take, uh, frequently uh, rescuing wounded out in the open. This is Embarkation Pier Cemetery on Gallipoli. Over 8,000 Australian and New Zealand lives were lost during the eight months of the Anzac campaign here in Turkey. Here is the grave of Captain Andrew Gillison. His official role was that of Captain to the 14th Battalion, 4th Brigade, looking after the spiritual and some of the social needs of the men. However, he met his death going about another task which he had unofficially adopted, that of rescuing the wounded. On August 21, the 14th Battalion was part of an attack on strong Turkish positions on Hill 60. The Australians were cut down by machine gun fire and the attack failed. As usual, Gillison was in the front line. Daniel, with so many men wounded, what did Gillison do? Well, he was right here, ready to react. The Turkish shell fire had set fire to the scrub here, and that created a kind of smoke screen. So Gillison, the medical officer, Captain Loughran, and the stretcher bearers, they went out and looked for as many wounded as they could find. But it was still very dangerous because the fire was setting off hand grenades and bullets, which were zinging around everywhere. So it was very risky to be bringing the wounded in from the front. The next day, Gillison was preparing for the burial of the men killed in the battle. Just as he began, he heard the groans of a wounded man still in the open. Despite strong warnings not to go out, Gillison and stretcher bearer Corporal Pittendry, a former Methodist minister, crawled out 50 metres to the wounded man. A Turkish sniper shot and wounded both of them. They ran back to the trenches, but their wounds were severe. Gillison had been hit in the shoulder with the bullet coming out his chest. He died in agony an hour later. Pit and Dry died that night. Their deaths were a tragedy. Many 4th Brigade men were at the funeral, for Chaplain Gillison was idolised by the soldiers he served. Months later, his successor as 14th Battalion Chaplain wrote in his diary, Dear me, the way the men speak of Mr. Gillison is wonderful. He is fairly worshipped by them, and I don't wonder. Daniel, talk us through a typical day in the life of an Anzac chaplain here at Gallipoli. Well, I'll take you through two typical days. Okay. A weekday would begin at first light, probably down at the beaches, visiting the wounded in the hospital, and then moving up through the valley, visiting various units under their care as they went, until they reached the front lines. They would distribute the mail, hand out parcels, and just socialise with the men and do what they could to lift their spirits. Again, okay, what about the second typical day that you mentioned? Well, that would be the Sunday, and uh, that was even more work because it would involve up to five church services a day. Again, from the beaches through to the frontline trenches. And 
Being involved in moving around so much actually put them at more risk than many soldiers. So a soldier would stay with their unit, often in some sort of protection, the trenches. It was those who had to move around who were most at risk from shell fire and snipers, and the chaplains were always on the move. One chaplain estimated that the typical padre worked 18 hours a day. This included the burial parties at night. We get away at about 11 p.m. and back to our dugouts any time from 2.30 to 8 a.m., according to the work to be done. As you can see, it's quite a steep climb up here from the beach, and I'm not as fit as I should be, but it's certainly a lot easier for me than it was for the chaplains. I'm not being shot at as I walk. Daniel, the activities here must have been very demanding on the, on the Anzac chaplains, walking up these cliffs from the, from the beach backwards and forwards during the day, and then burying the, the dead soldiers at night. Yes, it was a, certainly a very physical ordeal for them. One chaplain noted that he'd have to become as hard as iron if he was going to survive here on Gallipoli. But it wasn't just the physical thing, the, the amount of walking that they did up and down the hills. In a way, they had to deal with an emotional strain much more than the soldiers. A soldier might lose a mate every now and then, but a chaplain dealt with death on a daily basis. Bearing men that he probably knew very well and writing letters to the families and getting letters back, heart-wrenching letters, you know, they're just, I've read some of them, they're, they're, they're very emotional. And I don't think we should underestimate the emotional strain on top of the physical wear and tear that these chaplains endured here on Gallipoli. Dealing with the wounded was one of the hardest things the chaplains had to do. Uh, often the, the wounds were, were very nasty, um, bodies torn open, organs hanging out, and it could be made worse by dirt, by maggots. Uh, sometimes soldiers were brought in after several days of lying in the hot sun, uh, wounded. One chaplain's diary I read, he, he talks of having to tear the bandages off terribly sunburnt men with large patches of skin coming away and it was a horrifying experience for him to do. Made worse by the fact that some of the men that he treated made no sound at all, even though he knew they were in terrible agony. But it wasn't just the physical wounds that a chaplain had to deal with. There was also the, the emotional scarring, the constant dealing with men who are exposed to possible death at any moment. And constant shell fire, bullet fire, the risks they ran, many men suffered emotionally to the point where they couldn't cope anymore. Uh, today we talk about uh, shell shock or post-traumatic stress disorder, but they had no terms for it then and, and no understanding either. They simply thought that men lacked the nerve or lacked courage. But chaplains were often more sympathetic to the kinds of strains that the soldiers endured because many of them were pushed to the emotional brink themselves. I wanted to bubble and cry, and take them in my arms and soothe them, for their nerves were all racked as, as well as their actual wounds. Instead, I joked with them and made them laugh, and gave them cigarettes to smoke while I pulled the hard bandage from the wounds. The grateful looks on their faces as the wounds were freshly dressed were something to remember. You had to be tough to be an Anzac chaplain here at Gallipoli. But some of the stories that come out of here are amazing. Not even their regular duties were enough. Some chaplains are on record as having overheard a soldier wish for a fresh egg or a chocolate. So the chaplain hunted all over the peninsula till he had enough for each man in his unit, probably four or 500. One night, a chaplain single-handedly cut steps into a steep and difficult part of the track to make it easier for water carriers and stretcher bearers. So Daniel, we've spoken about the 
activities of a chaplain on a typical day. What about on a day of battle? Usually their place was at the first aid post, helping with the wounded. But there were chaplains who would stick close behind the attackers so that they were able to be uh, with the wounded and the dying while the battle was still raging. But then their work after the battle was probably the biggest thing. It was their task to continue helping with the wounded, to give last rites to those who were dying, and then the very sad task of identifying the dead. Soldiers on Gallipoli carried two discs uh, tied on a string round their neck. Uh, they were usually round, but they could be uh, hexagonal or oval or some other shape. But they both carried the same information. The soldier's name, their serial number, their battalion and their religion. So the chaplain would take one disc and place it with the body. The other disc they would keep as proof that the soldier had died. And it wasn't unknown for a chaplain after a very big battle to come out with three or four bags of these discs. You can imagine the emotional impact this would have on a chaplain having to conduct so many burials in such a short time. Daniel, here at Quinn's Post, we are right on the front line. Yeah. Here's some of the fiercest fighting in the entire campaign took place. Yep. Now, we know that the Turkish and Anzac trenches were nearly metres apart here at Quinn's Post. We know also that the Anzac chaplains came up here to the front line to visit their soldiers. Do we know whether these chaplains were actually involved in the fighting itself? Well, we know they weren't. There are some wonderful myths floating around of chaplains leading charges, this sort of heroic stuff, but they're fabrications. In fact, a couple of the chaplains noted in their diary at the time that these stories were floating around and were totally untrue. Stories are told about myself and a couple of other chaplains leading charges on the first day here, which of course is piffle. The men greatly appreciate the work of the chaplain and are over generous in their estimates. If you carry a fellow's rifle to help or some such thing as that, you have led a charge. There was one particularly militant chaplain, however, and that was the New Zealander, Henare Tewanohu, who was known to carry a revolver at times. He even performed a haka on the Anzac skyline. Gary, this is brilliant. Here we are in the front trenches. The Turks are just a few metres away. And behind me here, you can see a communication trench. Our men and supplies would come up through here to the front. The chaplains also would make their way from the rear of the Australian positions along this trench so that they could meet with the soldiers here in the front. They'd hold worship services, they'd bring them their mail, any kind of um, supplies, special supplies they could bring them, writing, paper, uh, a special treat, would come along this. So the chaplains came up here right to the front line? Right to the front, and the Turks are just literally metres away. Through the bush you can see the Turkish positions. It's amazing to think that the chaplains were involved right here in the front lines of the battle at Gallipoli. This close. With the whole of the Anzac positions under artillery fire, it was very difficult to run church services. On a given Sunday, provided conditions permitted it, the chaplains would move through the trenches, like these at the neck, running communion and worship services for a few dozen men at a time. On Sunday afternoons, a little after four, you'd see the Padre coming down Shrapnel Valley singing Jesus, lover of my soul, and the lads coming out of the dugouts like rabbits out of burrows and following him. 
When he got them into a comparatively sheltered corner, he proceeded to lead them in a short Sunday afternoon service. Till the storms of life is past, safe into the heaven guide, oh, receive my soul at last. One writer tells us of a Sunday evening worship service. Imagine the scene. Dotted around this bowl of hills are the small campfires of the men in their posts. Over the bay, the moon shines on the water and the stars seem close and bright. Overhead, the occasional shell explodes or bullet whines. But here, a chaplain is running a service. Crammed into a trench corner, about 30 men begin singing. Their hymn is taken up by the sentries at their posts and gradually, the men in other trenches around take up the song. Passing by, a platoon of armed warriors joins in the hymn as they march through to their new post. It's enough to make my spine tingle. It's easy to overlook the chaplains in the Anzac story, yet they were here and worked and suffered alongside their fellows, and their impact could be great. Chaplain Blackwood, who was shocked by the language of the Anzacs when he first met them, noted this once he got to know them. I have learned long since that the Australian soldier is a hypocrite, or perhaps to put it more mildly, a camouflage artist. To one who had not the sympathy to look beneath the surface, he seemed rather a hopeless proposition from the point of view of religion. The Aussie loved to pretend he had no religion, when all the time, deep beneath the surface in most cases, he had a real sense of God and of his moral law. And even those who were not religious found comfort in the rituals of prayer and song. And the chaplains did so much to provide those little comforts that eased the burden on the soldiers. And soldiers, as well as families at home, really appreciated having a clergyman read the service over their fallen comrades. So this story of Anzac, which has become its own religion in Australia and New Zealand, turns out to have more conventional religious aspects as well. Though it has been rarely admitted, faith and religion did play its small part in the legend of Gallipoli. Our special offer for you this program is this book, The Faith of the Anzacs. In here, you will discover more of the secrets of the faith of the Gallipoli Padres, as well as the stories of many soldiers who found their faith to be so vital to surviving the horrors of the war. Just call or visit our website. Here's the information you need. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020-422-2042 in New Zealand, or 770-800-0266 in the United States. Or visit our website, tij.tv, or simply scan the QR code on your screen, and we'll send you today's free offer, totally free of charge and with no obligation. You can also write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia, or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand, or PO Box 888717, Atlanta, Georgia, 
30356 USA. You can also email us at info at tij.tv. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you'd like to experience a sense of God in your own life, just like many of the Anzacs here at Gallipoli, I would invite you to join me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today we have heard the stories of men of faith who braved the dangers of war to bring your presence to those who face death every day, cut off from home and family and living under extreme stress. The soldiers often turn to the chaplains for support, counsel, prayer and inspiration. Father, in our own lives, may we seek to be models of your love. May those in need see in us the compassion, grace and warmth that attracted so many soldiers to the chaplains of Gallipoli. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>